Fantastic. So I will be monitoring the chat area and um, let you know if there's things you should be paying attention to. And if you all have specific questions about any of the information, uh, there actually are going to be a couple of places where I'd like to get your input. But if at, at any point during the presentation, if you have some questions, feel free to, to type those into the chat. Uh, I can get those from Carol. Um, obviously, the format is, is a little tricky for interaction, but we like for it to be as interactive as possible. So um, again, I'm a, I'm a physics teacher here uh, at the School of Science and Math in Durham. I've been here Oh, what, five or six years now? Um, I actually started my career in Carteret County in eastern North Carolina. So when I was there, I taught physical science and physics and chemistry. So it's kind of been in a couple of different settings. Um, and I've had the opportunity to, to teach with some different uh, types of students. And while what I'm presenting today, I've developed at science and math for physics classes, I think there are, there are some themes and pieces that would work, you know, if I were still back in, in Carteret County teaching with my students, I could still use some of this. So hopefully, regardless of, of where you are and where you're coming from, you'll find some of this information useful. So I'm going to use this acronym, or I guess this uh, symbol, P squared, uh, in part because I didn't want to keep typing purposeful problem solving over and over again. And P squared is sort of a nice compact way to, to, to say that. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about what purposeful problem solving is, why it's important and uh, what uh, education research has to say about the problem solving process, and then what we do at science and math to kind of help our students get better at problem solving. So here's a, a brief agenda, uh, kind of what we're going to look at. We've, we've asked some folks uh, this question already, but if you wouldn't mind just typing in the chat box, um, kind of give us a sense of, of uh, what your background is, so where are you from in North Carolina, and what is your, your specialty area, your day-to-day your -day job? Uh, are you a teacher, are you an administrator, are you a curriculum coach? Uh, do you work with high school kids? Do you work with uh, elementary, middle school kids, uh, college kids, that sort of thing? If you could just type that information into the box so we can kind of get a sense of who's here um, while we're going. So. Seventh grade math teacher. Okay, good. And teacher from Thomasville City. Teacher from Cleveland County. Secondary math curriculum coordinator. Okay, great. So yeah, actually at the Scaling STEM conference, there were a number of biology folks in the room. And I know you know some of the the content can differ a little bit from physics, but some of the strategies that we were using, uh, they seemed to think were helpful. So hopefully you'll we'll be able to find some good information here as well. I mean, problem solving is often a very interdisciplinary endeavor, so I think it sort of touches on a lot of different areas. So, well, great. That seems like we've got a nice diversity of, of people here, um, which will give us some good perspectives. So we're going to briefly get into a warm-up activity and then talk a little bit about this idea of purposeful problem solving um, and then get into sort of what the research says, talk a little bit about science and math. Uh, I also want to touch a little bit on technology, so how can you use technology to make uh, the problem solving process more interesting? Um, generate more interesting conversations with your students. Uh, and if we've got time at the end, I'd actually be really curious to learn from you all. What do you currently do to encourage problem solving with your students? Okay, so that's sort of our agenda. But I want to kind of warm up a little bit and get everybody thinking. Um, you know, it's probably towards the end of the school day, so uh, but we'll see what, what you can do with these questions. <laughs> Oh, so these are three questions. Um, they're actually, if you Google in the term Fermi questions, you can get a lot of questions like these. They're pretty interesting, but uh, three questions here. And I'd like for you to just pick one and spend maybe about four or five minutes thinking about this question that you pick. Um, and see, if, you know, see if you can come up with an answer to one of these questions. So take a look. And I'll pick a question. And write down some thoughts and sort of think about how you're going to go about solving this question. So, the time is down. Get the clock here. 319. Okay, great. So, we'll give you about uh, four or five minutes here. So, and you're welcome to use whatever resources you have at your disposal while you're doing this. Okay. 
these are these are fun questions to do. They're sort of the classic back of the napkin calculations. Um, that, uh, there's a good list of these in the, the physics teaching journal. The physics teacher they always have two of these in the, in the journal. So it's kind of nice to. If you think you have an answer, by all means, please uh, type it into the chat box if you can come up with a, um, with a number for each of these questions. Well, the first one, how far should you be willing to drive? Mm -hmm. There is no absolute answer for that mm -hmm. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the word should, it's a special word to be sure. Yeah. Some of these are they're sort of different types of, of questions. First one is sort of a almost a value statement, personal preference, that sort of thing. And um, four miles, all right. It says on a gallon. And I should know the answer of how much it costs to heat my hot water, <laughs> but I haven't paid yeah. attention. Are you the the typical American household with the uh, you know? Oh, 1.8 yeah. children. Yeah, 1.8 <laughs> children and 1.2 pets and. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. 2.3 two rooms. Okay, this person would uh, <laughs> right. Uh, Good point. Yeah, however far you can travel for four cents. Yeah. Yeah. Victoria, you bring up a good point, right? I mean, so you need to know some information, and depending on the starting point, what is your starting information, what are your starting assumptions, that's obviously going to influence the answer that you get. Um, right? How many people are there in a typical household? Right? How large is a typical house, right? Then those are all, all, all good questions. Another minute or two here, and then we'll discuss what kind of appliances, right? Right. You have an Energy Star water heater. You know what is your cost of electricity per kilowatt hour? That sort of thing. So I think North Carolina is relatively cheap. I think our energy is fairly, fairly cheap. It's 10, 12 cents a kilowatt hour, something like that. Like we've still got a few people joining in, so if you're just warm, uh, joining us, we're uh, starting off with a warm-up activity, just having people think a little bit about um, each of these three questions. We're sort of talking about problem solving, so it seems reasonable to start with a little bit of problem solving as well. So just having folks think individually about these and um, asking some new questions about, you know, the answer that you get is going to depend upon some things 5 times 10 to the 13th power. So looking at these questions, the first thing I think about is the kind of research that I'd have to do in order to start answering them. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, yeah, regardless of, of where we are, uh, we'll go ahead and proceed. I mean, the point of this is just to get you sort of thinking about the problem solving process and about how there are different types of, of problems and different types of questions that require different information. Ultimately, we're going to take questions like these and sort of contrast them with the traditional textbook problem, which generally contains about as much information you need to solve it. And more often than not, that information is sort of explicit within the problem. And you sort of contrast that with something like this, um, the answer you get could depend. You know, there are multiple correct answers depending upon your starting. Um, uh, starting assumptions. Um, 
and you know, in theory, uh, for a question like two, there there is a number out there somewhere that exists that we could potentially go out and research uh, what that number is. If we're sort of you know forced uh, to uh, uh, forced for time, we can always make some assumptions about what those numbers are and do some estimations. Whereas the first question is kind of more of a value statement, right? I mean, how far should that word should is very important as well. But um, kind of the point of of these questions again, thinking about the approach. Um, how did you think about these problems? What was your starting point? Is there a process that you can generalize for how to go about solving problems? And that's something that we're going to talk about today. I mean, have you ever thought about that before? How do you think about and solve problems? What kind of process do you use? So I'm, you know, I've studied and, and taught physics for a long time, so I've always kind of had this physics problem solving process in my head since I've been in high school, and I've found that to be a very valuable way of solving problems. But that's certainly not the only way uh, to solve problems. So Barry came up with an answer for number three, um, and he said that it was $800. Mm -hmm. um, so Barry, my question to you is, did you Google it? Did you, uh, um, or did you just know it because uh, you've been um, investigating? How did, yeah, how did you get to that answer? Because this generation is much more uh, likely to no. go right to the internet and look for the response to a, to a question. Okay. And it's important the way you phrase the question, mm -hmm. what kind of answer you're going to get. Oh. <laughs> Started out scientifically and then guessed. Yeah, so sort of an order of magnitude approximation. Yeah, sure. So the Fermi questions are kind of notorious for, yeah, it doesn't, you know, as long as you get about the right uh, order of magnitude, you're okay. Uh, it's kind of the process that matters more. Okay. So, and sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes you have to guess, right? So anyway, let's go ahead and move on. But again, just trying to get us to think a little bit about the problem-solving process as we talk more about kind of how, how we uh, encourage problem-solving in science. Now. <clears throat> so to kind of get a definition out on the table, when I say purposeful problem-solving, what does that mean? Uh, how do I like to think about it? Um, it? It's a method of solving problems that is very goal-oriented. Um, it's guided by a process. You know, so you kind of have a sense of where you're going uh, when you set out uh, to, to solve a problem. You're not just sort of uh, proceeding randomly and uh, just sort of trying things because uh, I, don't, I don't know what else to do, so I'll try this, this strategy. Uh, although sometimes good problem solvers have to be flexible, so they may start off on one path and realize, well, this isn't getting me to where I think I need to go, so I need to adapt and, and switch gears a little bit. And perhaps most importantly, this idea of purposeful problem solving is very good for solving uh, what I would refer to as ill-defined problems, problems that aren't necessarily obvious. It's not necessarily obvious what the answer is, and there may be multiple answers for, uh, for these problems. And that sort of kind of ill-defined problem is much more consistent with sort of a real-world problem where there could be multiple solutions. And so, you know, someone who's good at this or purposeful with problem solving is going to be better equipped to handle these kind of real world situations. Um, it, it's important to ask the question, is this a good thing? I'm assuming that it is, but uh, why do we care? Why, why is this a valuable skill for our students to have? Um, because currently, I, I'm not sure that, um, that we explicitly test for this on sort of a state level. If we look at the EOCs, I don't know um, how many ill-defined problems that you're going to find in a scientific or mathematical context. So, you know, if it's not tested, why should we care? Well, we got the, the next-gen science, um, yeah, what, it's, what is tested in life, right? So uh, that's certainly uh, important. Um, and as the next-gen science standards roll out, uh, problem solving, the ability to, to solve real-world problems via engineering and design is a major point of emphasis in the uh, next generation science standards. And I am not familiar enough with common core and mathematics to know how prevalent problem solving is. And I'd love it if, if somebody who is familiar with common core could potentially uh, maybe speak a little bit to how problem solving, should, real world problem solving shows up there. But I know in science, of course, um, this idea of real world problem solving, engineering and design is really important. So, you know, on that, in that regard, you know, I, I think uh, if, the, if the next gen science standards dictate how we do uh, education in North Carolina in the next 10 years or so, this is going to become very important. Um, but also, yes, as someone alluded to a minute ago, um, you know, teaching people for life. So problem solvers are desirable. You know, when you're trying to get a job, when you're trying to get in college, uh, people want people who can solve problems. I heard a quote you know, five, six years ago, you're never going to get paid to solve a problem that you've already solved before, right? You're going to get paid to solve new problems that you haven't seen before. So it's a, it's a valuable skill that can translate across a variety of different jobs. 
So um, sort of taking the, the definition of problem solving a little bit trivial here, so I think it's important to define problem solving. So this is a definition from sort of a primary source education research article, but I actually like this next definition a lot more. So what is problem solving? What you do when you don't know what to do. Uh, by definition, a problem means that you're in a novel situation. You're kind of out uh, in the unknown a little bit, and you have to, to think about how to, how to navigate that situation when you don't know what the answer is. Okay. So kind of contrast the notion of a problem with what we're going to call an exercise. We'll kind of get into what that is in a minute, but I want to get you thinking a little bit more um, about sort of this idea of what do you do when you don't know what to do. So think about these four questions for a minute, all right? So you got sort of a question about Santiago, Chile, uh, the distance between there and Durham. How many feet are there between here and, and Santiago? How many gallons of gas does it take to drive there? How many Snickers bars would you have to eat to be able to walk there <laughs> as well? Okay. So, you know, if you think about a, a problem as sort of a situation that's potentially ill-defined, kind of a real-world type problem, um, and contrast that with um, with what we're going to call an exercise, which tends to be sort of a little bit more cut and dry, concrete. You think about these four questions. Um, which of these questions is more sort of an exercise than a problem? Okay, which one sort of has a definite answer? Which one is concrete? Um, which one, uh, with respect to, to a problem, which one are you going to have to think a little bit more about? Which one are you going to have to potentially make some assumptions? Which, which of these questions are all defined? And hopefully, as you look at these questions, it's, it's, um, it's obvious that sort of the first question, I mean, there is a right answer, right? So it's something you could look up. It's a piece of information. It's a fact. Um, you know, contrast that to the fourth question, how many Snickers bars would you have to take to walk? Um, kind of like a Fermi question, you've got to make some assumptions, you've got to think. That's a hard question to do. I'm not sure I know how to answer that question immediately. So I would consider the last question more of a problem than the first, which I would consider an exercise. Because exercises tend to be uh, situations in which there's one correct answer, you're applying something familiar, there's a small number of steps. Um, generally the process is pretty rigid um, compared to a problem which hopefully is, is uh, as we've seen already, is, is potentially a little bit more ill-defined, might have a lot of steps, might have um, a variety of pathways to get to the answer as well. So, you know, problems, um, when I teach, I really like to, to emphasize this idea of problems. Now, exercises are important, and don't want to downplay the importance of an exercise, but I think a problem is going to invite more thinking on the part of the students. Uh, it is a little bit harder. Um, and, and it's also important to note that what might be an exercise for one student could be a problem for another student. There may be one student in your class who knows exactly what to do when you put a uh, question on the board, in which case that would be an exercise for one student, but for another could be a problem. And so there's sort of a differentiation uh, issue with this uh, difference. For the same question, you can have two different students kind of approach it differently. Okay. So getting back to this idea of encouraging purposeful problem solving, kind of knowing what to do, being goal oriented. Okay. A situation that invites purposeful problem solving generally is going to be open-ended, uh, potentially with multiple solutions and pathways. It's going to involve real-world uh, situations, which are often ill-defined. Um, like most real-world problems, you're probably either going to have too much information through which you have to filter or too little information. You have to go out and research more information. And I think perhaps most importantly, when, when you know, you think about a problem solving, you might think about a traditional textbook problem that you could solve in five minutes. I would argue that perhaps the most interesting problems take a lot of time to solve. And so problems can, can range in scope from very, very short to very long as well. And they're both valuable, uh, but I think kind of having opportunity to solve both types of problems is really important. So here's an example of what I would consider to be a question that might um, that might invite more purposeful problem solving on, on the part of students. How fast do electrons move in a lightning strike? So, as folks pointed out earlier, there are a lot of pieces of information that you might need to know before you can arrive at what you would consider to be a good answer for a question like that. Well, how high is the cloud? What's the weather like uh, that particular day? What's the humidity? What's the moisture? Um, there are a lot of factors that could potentially um, make getting an answer to a question like this difficult. And so you have to potentially make some simplifying assumptions to be able to do this correctly. Um, but this is a, a lot, if you contrast this with you know sort of a traditional textbook physics problem about you know there's a capacitor plate with a potential difference of 10,000 volts. How fast will an electron be moving at the end of that um, 
in, in essence, this problem and that problem are testing similar concepts, but this problem is doing it in a much more open-ended fashion, uh, and the answers can be varied depending on the starting assumptions that the student has. So um, hopefully, at, the, at this point, uh, we can agree that problem solving is important. Um, so the next uh, question becomes, well, how do we get students to become better at problem solving and more purposeful at problem solving? So I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about what science and physics edge education research say, because ultimately I think we, we need to sort of look to the literature and use that to guide what we do in the classroom as much as we can. Um, so how, what, what do science ed and physics ed researchers tell us about how to get better at problem solving? So kind of in a nutshell, if we look at characteristics of experts, uh, people who are really good and really purposeful with their problem solving, we see that these people have what's called sort of a strong physical intuition. They kind of have a general sense of uh, what to expect in, in the situation. If you give them a, a question, they may have a gut instinct that generally tends to be right. Um, a lot of times that's a function of experience, uh, and that's a hard thing to do when you're dealing with younger students. Um, these people tend to be very, uh, very persistent, so they're not easily discouraged. They're gritty, if you've heard that term before, grit in uh, psychological literature. They're willing to keep going even if they don't get the answer immediately, uh, which actually is, is, uh, can be a problem with some of the students here at Science and Math. They're so used to getting the answer immediately. Um, and I saw this with the honor students that I would teach when I was at uh, Proatan um, in my previous job. They weren't patient. If they didn't get the answer immediately, uh, they would get frustrated and quit. So that's a tricky thing uh, to, to do. It's a hard characteristic, um, but it, it's one that, that purposeful problem solvers has. They're very efficient in what they do, high task efficiency, and they're goal-oriented. So they kind of know what they're doing, <coughs> and they're also efficient with the process. And finally, they're flexible. So they kind of know if, if what I'm doing now, they can evaluate what they're doing. So they're metacognitive as well. They, they can kind of self-monitor what they're doing and uh, look at whether or not uh, the strategy is successful and change it if it needs to be. Okay. Um, this is a little bit more physics related, but I think it, 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 it's, there are some analogs to these ideas in other disciplines as well. But um, one of the, the strategies that good expert like physics problem solvers have is one of the characteristics that they have is that they can represent a similar idea multiple ways. So if you look at the bottom three, di uh, bottom three pictures, each of these is a different way of representing the concept. Uh, of, uh, of force Newton's second law, basically. Over here on the right, there's a mathematical statement that represents this idea that unbalanced forces cause an object to accelerate. Here, you've got a, a traditional, what's called a force diagram, which is essentially is, is uh, communicating this, uh, this similar concept, this idea that unbalanced forces cause things to accelerate. And then over here, you've got on the left, you've got a picture, sort of a real world diagram about what would happen. And so, in physics, people who are really good at problem solving, people who are really good at purposeful at problem solving, are very good at moving back and forth between these representations. So they might, you know, think about the situation in a diagram for form first. Um, maybe they draw a force diagram and then uh, introduce a mathematical equation. But they can also jump back and forth. They can think about the problem in multiple ways. Um, they can sort of analyze uh, the, the process. I mean, this issue of analysis versus exploration is all about. <coughs> Exploration implies that you're kind of just searching for, for a process, whereas analysis means you kind of know what you're doing uh, and are proceeding in a logical, purposeful fashion. Okay, And again, there's this idea of flexibility as well. Another big uh, issue, especially in physics, one of the things that's kind of interesting, um, and, and those of you that teach physics may know this, students in an introductory physics course often try to math their way out of doing physics by memorizing equations. It's, it's pretty common uh, here and it's a challenge we have to deal with. And I like to, to compare that strategy to reacting to a loose screw by grabbing tools randomly until you can find the right one. So it would be as if I see a loose screw, I'm just going to randomly reach into the toolbox, I'm going to grab a hammer, I'm going to try it if that works. Uh, great. If it doesn't work, you know, I'm going to go get another one. And so ultimately, it's a strategy that I guess over time can work, but it's not very efficient. <laughs> it's not very purposeful. Um, and I would argue that probably the better thing to do would be when you see a loose screw, think first before you grab the tool about what kind of problem you've got and then find the appropriate tool. So what physics ed researchers find is that people who, are, who spend more time on the conceptual and qualitative side who think about the physics first before they grab the math are much better and much more efficient. And so that's something that we value with our students here is this idea of, of emphasizing qualitative and conceptual uh, reading, <coughs> excuse me, reasoning and using that as, as a way to plan 
as well. So that's another characteristic that in physics expert problem solvers have is they know how to reason qualitatively. Okay. So that some of the characteristics of experts and I would think our goal as teachers is to help our students become more expert like. So how do we do that uh, with our students? Well one way is to explicitly uh, instruct students, teach students how to how to reason like experts. Um, encourage them to think about their thinking. Encourage them to monitor how they're thinking about situations and start this kind of internal uh, dialogue with themselves. Uh, conversation, well, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And we'll talk in a few minutes about specific ways that, that you can do that as well. I think it's important that students understand why a particular project, the process is structured in a certain way. So when I teach classes, I find it important to justify to students why we are doing what we are doing. So I like to ask the question, why, a lot. And in this case, if there's a particular problem solving process, well, why is it important that you draw this force diagram or draw this energy bar chart, that sort of thing. And then again, getting at this idea of qualitative and conceptual uh, reasoning, encourage both. So you know, don't just give students you know, an equation, give them the, the corresponding concept. I find often that the conceptual reasoning can be much more difficult than the math which um, sometimes you can sort of do a problem without really understanding it. Okay, And then kind of like with most things, you get better in most things by practicing, but purposeful practicing. So if you want students to get better at solving open-ended problems, you've got to give them open-ended problems. You can't give them exercises and expect that they would be good at problem solving. So it's an issue of selecting activities that um, that align with what, with what your goals are for the students. So if your goal is to create great problem solvers, then you need to give students opportunities to practice problems, not opportunities to do exercises as well. So give them some new opportunities that are challenging. Okay. So um, specific examples of how we do it at uh, the School of Science and Math, here's sort of a, a list of, of strategies that we use to encourage our students to be a little bit more purposeful. So the first one is, is hopefully fairly obvious. We want to model the approach. So most students come in to our, to our courses um, not used to sort of thinking about problems in a very systematic fashion. So we have to do a lot of work to convince them, one, that they should, why it's important, uh, and then to help them develop those skills and those practices. So we, we model that as teachers in class when we write up problems on the board and write up solutions as well trying to model that approach. Um, we also do <coughs> a lot of group work, both in and out of class, because you know, oftentimes when you have um, situations that are open-ended and ill-defined, having multiple perspectives and opinions is a very, very important um, way to, to deal with uh, the complexity and, and to kind of break through if you're getting stuck. Having multiple people at the table can often help. So do a lot of group work, uh, both in class and out of class. Uh, and not just on projects and labs, but even on homework assignments. You know, we encourage our students to collaborate <coughs> within reason uh, when they're when they're doing the work as well. Uh, two strategies that I really like a lot. Uh, the first one is called show and tell. Uh, so what we'll do with something like that is we'll assign a problem. Sometimes we'll assign a really difficult problem for homework just to kind of see how the students react to it. And then the next day, we'll sort of randomly select a student to present her or his work and then talk about what she or he did uh, and then get feedback from the class. So, you know, give, give the students some constructive criticism on um, her approach or his approach. What did she do well? Uh, what are there aspects of the solution that uh, were not included that she needs to include for next time? Did other people do the problem differently? Kind of the point of the show and tell, um, it gives students an opportunity to, to practice, but it also gives them an opportunity to talk about what they've done. And um, one of the particular uh, philosophies of learning that I like a lot uh, really emphasizes the idea of conversation. Conversations are really important. Students learn a lot by talking to each other and making their ideas explicit. So in my classroom, I try to, to generate as much conversation about that and show and tell is one way to do that. Another activity that I like to use a lot is called pass the problem. So, and, and this works uh, when you have sort of groups. So kind of the way this works is I'll have, imagine I have you know, four groups of students in my class, what I'll do is I will generate four folders, and inside of each folder is a problem prompt. So I'll pass out a different problem uh, in each of the four folders to each of, of the student groups. So we, all four student groups have a different problem. And so they'll spend maybe 15 or 20 minutes working on the problem, kind of coming up with a solution. Then I'll call time. They'll put the work that they've done back into the folder, and then we'll rotate. 
so another group has the folder that they just worked on. And so that second group will work on that problem, but they'll work on it without looking at the first group's work. So they'll independently come up with a second solution to that problem. Then we'll rotate again, so there'll be a third solution to that problem that's independent of the first two. And then on the fourth pass, what we do is we ask that fourth group to take a look at all of the th all three previous solutions. Look at those solutions, analyze those solutions, think about which of those solutions is the best, which is the most convincing, which is the best solution, the most comprehensive solution. And then their job, their job isn't to work the problem, their job is to write up and synthesize using other students' work what the best solution was and then they present that solution. So they present a solution to a problem that they haven't worked. They're kind of uh, taking that information and synthesizing it. So I've found in the past this is a really good way uh, to expose students to multiple ways of doing the problem, uh, to multiple assumptions. Some, some students make different assumptions than they might. They may have different strategies. So it's a good way to expose students to those multiple ways of solving problems. And again, it encourages conversation. So students are talking about, well, why did this group do this? Why didn't they assume that? And so it gets them thinking about and talking about different ways of, of solving problems, getting at that notion of flexibility again, you know, being able to do a problem multiple ways. <coughs> so um, also with, with all of our courses, kind of the second two uh, bullet points sort of go together. Um, we encourage multiple representations, and one of the ways we encourage that is by incentivizing students uh, with our point rubrics. So kind of to give you an example of what this means, um, if I give my students a problem, let's say that problem's worth 10 points, it's on a homework or a test, probably of those 10 points, two of them will be the answer. So if all a student does in, is, is write down the answer, even if the answer is correct, they get two out of 10. And students hate this when they get to science and math. They get really, really frustrated uh, by, by this idea. But what, what our goal is, is to get them to explicit, to, to think about and, and communicate explicitly what their thought process is. So maybe a picture of the situation is worth two points. Maybe the force diagram is worth two. Maybe there's a list of assumptions that they're making to simplify the problem is worth, worth one. Maybe the math and the algebra is worth two. So you're sort of incentivizing each aspect of what you want in the solution by assigning points to it and, and grading uh, appropriately. So there's actually a, a document that we'll post on the, on the website with this presentation that has sort of a standard problem solving procedure that we use with a lot of our courses in science and math and what the steps are. If you want to take a look at that, that will be available for you. But you know, like, like most people, students respond well to incentives. So if you incentivize it with your grading rubrics and your point values, assign a lot of credit for the work that you want to see, not just the answer, you're going to get students to, to, uh, to think a little bit more about the process than just the answer as well. Um, and uh, one thing that I've started doing recently uh, in the last, I think, two years is I've had students start to think uh, about and, and write down what their assumptions are when they do a problem. So, you know, everybody makes assumptions all the time. We have to, otherwise you know, we, would, we would be inundated with, with information. So we have to make some assumptions in order to, to get through life and, and solve problems. But I always think it's important to know what those assumptions are. And so what I've started doing recently is asking students, when you do a physics problem, make a list of assumptions that you're making. So, you know, your air resistance is negligible, negligible friction, constant acceleration. That, those are sort of common assumptions for uh, sort of, you know, first semester physics, that sort of thing, um, just to get them in the habit of it. And, and it's interesting um, to pay attention to what that step has done to student conversations. When I walk around class when they're working on problems, listening to them to talk, and, and this is anecdotal evidence, but um, I feel like in the last two years since I've implemented this step, I hear much more, I hear phrases like, well, what are we assuming for this problem? Did you assume that? Um, I'm not sure I like that assumption. I, I hear kids say those phrases more and more and more and um, than they did previously. So this idea of making them mindful about uh, what they're what they're writing down and what they're doing when they solve problems. I, I just happen to think that there's a very strong connection between uh, thinking and writing uh, and communicating. So if you can get kids to write <coughs> about something, hopefully that will, will alter their thinking somehow. So encouraging assumptions when you, uh, when you solve a problem. And then finally, kind of uh, this idea of longer problems that are more open-ended. So the idea of 
open-ended investigations that are ill-defined. So uh, we recently just finished an open-ended investigation where the goal was to safely land a human spacecraft on Mars using any landing strategy that you would like. It's kind of an engineering project. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. And so we were doing that project as a way to think about the connection between um, motion, so D DVATs, kind of kinematics and dynamics. So what is the motion that you need to land safely on Mars and then how do you create that motion with rockets and parachutes and uh, that sort of thing. So, and But it was cool because there were a variety of different ways that students could do that. So, you know, you could have four or five different landing strategies. Then you can have an interesting conversation about, well, which one is the best and why. So this group over here may land on Mars, but maybe they need twice as much fuel as that group. And so then you can get an interesting conversations about the, the economics of space travel and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, talking about Mars is obviously important right now because of the work that NASA is doing with the Curiosity. So. <clears throat> kind of an interesting justification for why units are important too for the, the famous catastrophe from a couple of years ago with the, with the crashed uh, um, Martian uh, probe as well. So it, it's a good project, it's very interdisciplinary, uh, potentially brings in a lot of interesting conversations that aren't necessarily physics related and it takes time. So it's a big project and so students have to work in groups and learn how to break up aspects of this big project to get it done. So those are, those are, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but th this is uh, you know, a, a sample of some things that we do at Science and Math to encourage students to be more purposeful with their problem solving. Okay. Any, anybody had any questions? All right. Yeah, encourage you to go ahead and use the chat area if you have a question that uh, you'd like you have to, to uh, consider. Okay, so to give you a sense, we talked about this idea of rubrics and multiple representations. Well, what does this look like in the context of a uh, of a student uh, paper? Okay, so Barry asks, relative to what? And I'm not. Oh, yeah. how fast are we with respect to the electron? Well, let me show you the, the student solution here. And it's not, uh, this isn't actually complete. It was a multi page solution, but kind of as an example of in, in an open ended problem where where you've got some multiple representations. So here's a, a problem solution, sort of randomly picked a problem solution from a student that did this problem. And hopefully what you see is that there are different ways of thinking about the problem. So you've got, you know, sort of a, a picture diagram of what's going on. Down here you've got what's called an energy bar chart. Right here you've got some math, mathematical representations uh, of the problem. You've got a list of, of known informations as well as a list of researched and assumed values, so again, getting students to be explicit about what they're doing uh, as well. And, you know, sort of a, a, a kind of a traditional um, one-step mathematical approach would only have a solution that has kind of one line in it, but here you're giving students the opportunity to sort of communicate a little bit more of what their thought process is, which is, I think, helpful for me as a teacher. I can get a sense of what they know, uh, but it's also helpful for them for no other reason than they, they get partial credit, uh, which some of them certainly like that. The ones that give the answer real quick don't like this, and the ones that uh, struggle a little bit more do like it um, as well. Anyway, um, you know, technology is, is an important part uh, of education, no doubt, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about how technology can help um, make this uh, easier. Um, you know, how, how can technology enhance our ability to generate uh, problem-solving opportunities for students. So, you know, the, the first thing that springs to mind would be smartphones. So everybody's got a smartphone. Most of them have cameras. So students, in theory, could go out in the real world and videotape something that's interesting and bring it back into the classroom. So to give you an example, I was in Europe uh, this summer and I was riding on the Eurostar, which is the high-speed train which connects London and Paris, and I had my iPad with me. And I was just curious, how fast is the train going right now? Um, so I just pulled out my iPad and I started shooting some video. And if anybody knows uh, about the, I think it's the Vernier app or the Logger Pro app, uh, the video physics app, I think on the iPad, I was able to use the uh, image that I shot in class to generate a data set that we actually used to figure out how fast the train was going. So that was kind of a cool example of using technology to kind of answer a real world question. How is the, uh, but, but it led to interesting conversations about, well, what is the scale, you know, what can we use for scale in the background? And ultimately we had to assume, we had to look at a car and assume, all right, there's a van, I think it's about this big, we're going to use that for scale. Um, you know, with videoing you get an interesting questions about perspective and that sort of thing. But again, I mean, again the point is to generate conversation uh, among students. 
So there's also something else that's kind of interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, a student showed me a YouTube clip, and he asked me, is it real? So I thought I'd share that with you, because it's kind of interesting. So, so the basic premise here is that someone is sticking an iPhone inside of their guitar and pointing the iPhone up. Yeah, the, the student was asking whether or not this is real or whether or not someone has doctored, uh, doctored the image. Uh, and I have an opinion on this. I will not give it to you. Uh, but I think you, you could do this with a lot of different YouTube clips. I think I've seen one where Kobe Bryant jumps over a swimming pool. I think there may have even been an article in the physics teacher about that. But you know, these clips that are on YouTube, are they real? You know, um, So it's kind of a fun activity to sort of uh, apply a uh, apply physics to more kind of real world context as well. Um, we're lucky at Science and Math to, to have uh, a really nice uh, data analysis uh, package called Logger Pro, which allows us to do some pretty complex, complicated mathematics uh, with a couple of clicks of a mouse. So if we have a data set, it's just, we can put our data into Logger Pro, and we can do a variety of different types of fits, which gives us uh, good insight into the behavior uh, of uh, a particular uh, situation. So in the case of the, of the train, you know, I could kind of map the position of the, of the train over time uh, or something in the background, and we could plot that on a graph of position versus time or velocity versus time and look at those different graphs and see uh, from those graphs how we can figure out how fast the train is going, that sort of thing. So Logger Pro is a really nice uh, way to, to it, it takes, um, it, it makes data fitting very easy. It takes out a lot of the headaches about that, so it's really nice. Um, we do a lot, of, again, do a lot of teamwork uh, collaboration and group work. So we've recently been using Google Docs a lot, uh, and even Facebook to a certain extent. And um, had kind of an interesting uh, situation back in the fall. We were doing an energy and sustainability project, and we had some students that were looking at um, how students, their peers, and so science and math is a residential school, students live here. And so they were looking at how much energy their peers were using on a daily basis, so they literally set up a, a Facebook poll, a Facebook survey to survey their peers about their, their personal energy usage, uh, which was uh, interesting. And it also led to some really good statistical conversations about what is your sample, is it a representative sample, who's, you know, it's, it's a convenient sample, right, it's, but how representative is it and how does that show up uh, in your uh, uncertainty analysis? You know, I'm, it's probably better to have that survey than not, but at the end of the day, do you think the actual answer is bigger than this, smaller than this? What's the uncertainty, that sort of thing as well? Um, and actually, in the last two or three years, I've been messing around a little bit with uh, uh, v Python, which is a programming language which you can use to do uh, some very powerful physics and do some very interesting simulations with minimal coding knowledge. Um, and so I think last year, a student in my AP calculus-based physics class asked me a question um, and I had a hunch to what the answer was, but I wasn't quite sure. And so um, I went to um, went sort of back home and wrote a program uh, to to look at this uh, the motion of a particle. It was it was a velocity selector situation, if you know what that is. And so what happens, you know, if the velocity is too high or too low? Sort of specific explanation of the path of the particle. I think I actually have a picture of it here. So. Um, and it was kind of cool because uh, I was doing this independent of that. I had a student who was also doing some numerical simulations in Mathematica. So we came back two days later and had a really good conversation about the particle, and we were able to use the Python to model. Um, simulation is, is uh, a, a very powerful way to analyze complicated situations because computers are so powerful these days, you can really do a lot. And uh, for people who are interested in, in being professional scientists, knowing how to program is really important. So vPython is actually a really nice way to um, to um, do some complex coding or complex simulations with, with minimal coding knowledge. And um, NC State, I think, has a really good YouTube channel with some introductory uh, vPython stuff. So I would urge you to check that out if you're interested uh, in that. <coughs> So um, I also want to tell you a little bit about some research that I did last year um, when, when we had sort of been beginning to sort of be more explicit about students' assumptions and give them more opportunities to do things like pass the problem. I did some research last year on my students 
where I had them solve some open-end problems and I videotaped what they were doing and had them talk about their, their thought process and then analyzed uh, that. And I was looking at their uh, responses and sort of contrasting them with another paper that I had read that looked at uh, professional physicists, so you know, postdocs and, and professors, um, and looked at their ability to solve open-ended problems. And what was really neat about uh, the results of the research that I did was I found out that with five or six 90-minute lab sessions on open-ended problem solving, my students were able to, to exhibit some very expert-like characteristics with very little time investment uh, on, on my part. So that was really encouraging that they were able, just with a little bit of practice, were able to, to do things that even expert uh, physicists, or I should say they were experts in traditional problem solving. They weren't experts in ill-defined problem solving. And that speaks to this idea that just because you're an expert in one thing doesn't necessarily mean you're an expert in another. So it was very encouraging to me to see these students get so much better at problem solving with such a minimal amount of time input on my end. So I think that speaks to the importance uh, of practice and purposeful targeted practice as well, uh, which was great. Now the one piece that was a little bit weak in my students was this piece of, of metacognition, so self-monitoring what they were doing and asking themselves, so I got an answer, is that answer reasonable? Um, is it too big, is it too small? That, that was a piece that was lacking, which um, I think there are some very good developmental psychology reasons why, uh, why teenagers would have a problem with that. but. Uh, I'm, I'm still interested in looking at are there ways that we can better encourage them to be more uh, metacognitive, to think about the process while they are um, while they were solving problems. So, but it was very encouraging. It was sort of a first step. Uh, I'll probably do some additional follow-up research this year on on a different group of students to see um, see if I can extract some more information about what we do with science and math. But uh, so I'm cautiously optimistic about um, about what we're doing here and think that that it um, has has some real possibility uh, to help students become better at the problem solving uh, process. So, um, kind of at the end of the day, I mean, for you all, the real issue is. You know, how do, what do I do? How do I take this back? Uh, what can I do to, to current practice to make it more consistent with this idea of, of problem solving? So what I would urge you to, to think about here is to think about how could you take a traditional textbook problem and make it more aligned with this idea of purposeful problem solving? So there's a fantastic TED talk by a guy named Dan Meyer. Uh, who is, uh, a math, I think he was a math teacher in California and now he's a, a graduate student at Stanford, but uh, the, the link is here in PowerPoint. If you just uh, Google Dan Meyer and TED Talk, you'll find it. Uh, but it's a great, great, um, great TED Talk about um, what, what differentiates exercises and problems, sort of textbook problems versus traditional problems, uh, problem solving uh, that's a little bit more ill-defined. So um, I would urge you to check that out, especially for the math folks. But I think, um, you know, for, for, uh, for other folks, even folks that aren't math, if you could just think for a minute about what does a textbook problem do for students that prevents them from thinking about uh, some of these other issues? And how could you tweak a textbook problem so it requires more thinking? How could you turn a textbook problem from an exercise, or a textbook exercise, into a problem? Okay, so you know, just think about that for a minute. And if anybody's got any suggestions, um, are there just simple ways? You know, you, you don't have to start huge with this. You can start small. You know, just open up a textbook right now and look at it. What could you do to a textbook question to make it more of a problem than an exercise? Does anybody have any thoughts on how to do that? to practice good wait time here. <laughs> yeah. Take away information or add more? Absolutely. So throw in a couple of red herrings into the problem or take away information. Yeah, great. Um, so again, I mean, one of the things that Dan Meyer talks about is how, you know, a traditional textbook problem, you need three pieces of information to solve the, the, to answer the question, and conveniently there are three pieces of information that are there. You know, maybe the real tricky ones have two, but um, by, yeah, I mean, absolutely, by, by, uh, by taking away some information or adding more, you, you make students have to think uh, a little bit more. So other ideas about how to, how to make a textbook exercise more of a problem?
enhance the situation to require more assumptions. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So um, think about a situation that could potentially have, you know, how could you tweak the problem so it has multiple, or the question so it has multiple answers based upon your assumptions, right? So um, remove the cookbook process mm -hmm. and um, ask students to create their make the students create their own process. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a little bit more of a, of a lab-based technique, which is something I didn't touch on, but something that's certainly important, you know, sort of laboratory. I mean, laboratory exercises should be about problem solving, right? You know, I have a question and I need to answer it. What do I have to do? So yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, less cookbook type labs are, are a great way to get students to think a little bit more about that. Um, solve the problem two different ways. Right. And demonstrating that you could get to the, the answer this way or this way, absolutely. So you know, there's not just one way to do it. Yeah, these are these are all excellent ways to encourage students to be a little bit more uh, purposeful and in, in their actions, get them to think a little bit more about the problems uh, that you're working on. So, and again, I mean, I understand that there there are very real pressures. Uh, of curriculum and content coverage, and, and so I'm not advocating that everybody, you know, sort of goes out and scraps your curriculum and starts over again. I think it's important to, you know, you, you can integrate pieces of this strategy with minor tweaks to what you currently do. You don't have to completely overhaul what you're doing. If, if nothing, if you leave here today with nothing else than knowing that there's a difference between an exercise and a problem, and that problems tend to get students to think more, I think that that's a, a key message. Uh, and hopefully you can you can think about how to turn exercises into problems as well. And if you have any questions about uh, ideas or questions about how to do that in the future, I'll give you my email address here in a minute. Please feel free to to forward those uh, questions along. Okay. Um, we've sort of done that already. So I'm curious. Are so I've, I've talked about some specific ways, and and other folks have have given some some good uh, suggestions for how to. Um, encourage students to how to take textbook exercises and turn them into problems. But I'm curious if anybody else has other uh, strategies or methods for getting students uh, to problem solve, specific classroom activities or specific techniques that you use with your students to encourage purposeful, goal-oriented, flexible problem solving. Anybody get anything that they could share? Ideas that, uh, that they use? And there have been some good ones already, the idea of sort of more open-ended labs and multiple uh, solution paths to problems, more assumptions, that sort of thing. Anybody have any other activities? Change a given value. Mm -hmm. So changing values in, in a given question, okay, mixing them up a little bit. I used to make my physics students follow a step-by-step -step proce process when solving problems. They had to write down given information, problems, equations, solutions, and a check. Mm -hmm. Right. And we actually do, yeah, we do something similar at science and math. I mean, again, I mean, it's all kind of a piece of that, but write a, a problem-solving process. And I like this idea of a check at the end, right? So I'm assuming that you're checking to see if the answer is reasonable, doesn't make sense. Um, and, and that's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's a really important thing to do, really, or checking units, right? So that really encourages students to don't just stop when the, when the calculator spits out the number, right? The calculator's only as smart as you make it. So if you make a, a, a typing mistake, then you might get an answer that, that, that isn't reasonable. So, and again, that, that really encourages students to be metacognitive, to think about their answer, to, to think about their thinking. Is this a reasonable number? And that's a really good last step as well. Okay, yeah, great, all, all good suggestions. I'm sure there are others as well. But, um, so kind of getting close to the end here, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. So um, some take home messages uh, from this in addition to this idea of problem versus exercise. Um, you know, I, hopefully it's uh, obvious from the presentation at least that I think 
problem solving is a really, really important skill. I mean, the, the rhetoric right now about sort of the 21st century economy and the skills that students are going to need and the jobs that, that they are going to have aren't even invented yet, that sort of thing. So um, we're in a world now where the sum of human knowledge, you can access it with a device the size of a credit card. So you know what students know and what, what they need to know, I think, is a little different than what it was. Um, you know, when I went through through high school, so you know, different skill set and problem solving and open-ended problem solving is certainly an important uh, tool uh, for them. Um, difference between problem and exercise as well. So you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, I think all, all good teachers are, are are proud thieves, proud and honest thieves, and and so you know, there's a lot of great stuff out there already. So you know, Fermi questions are fantastic if you're a physics teacher. Just go look up Fermi questions. You know, take things from other people. There's a lot of great information that's out there. Um, if you want to steal anything from me, send me an email. I'll be happy to send you some information as well. Um, and don't be a martyr. I mean, do this. I think it's easier to do this sort of thing if you have help. So you know, try to, to work with other people. Try to collaborate. You know, if there's a math teacher, if you're a science teacher and there's a math teacher, and you can both try to sort of brainstorm with one another. If there are other science teachers, if you're middle school, if you're in a team with other folks, um, you know, trying to, to maybe a math science combination. Uh, of more sort of purposeful problem solving with your students. Uh, that, that's really, really important. And finally, you know, don't go from zero to 60 in two nanoseconds. I mean, this is, you know, this is a gradual process. So start small, uh, unless you really want to start big, in which case, more power to you. But um, you don't necessarily have to change overnight. And, and actually, at Science and Math, it's taken us a number of years to get to where we currently are. And we're constantly tweaking and we're constantly changing. I think I said this idea of writing down assumptions is about two years old now. So you know, we're constantly looking at what we do and trying to evaluate and see if it's working. And so you know, the expectation of gradual change. I think change can be more sustainable um, when you know, sort of gradual and, and, and incremental. Um, I think the chances of sort of buy-in from people around you and the chances of long-term success are probably better if you're, if you're starting small and integrating things over time. If you're really busy and pressed for time, it's more likely to stick that way. Okay. So, um, so yeah, just kind of four, uh, four messages uh, for, for you all to take home um, based on what we talked about already. So um, I think Carol has a link to an online survey and evaluation. And, and we'd love to know if this information uh, is useful to you all, and if so, how it is, and what you sort of got out of spending your time. We appreciate you spending your time uh, here this afternoon. We know you all are busy, so thanks for joining us as well. There's my email address. Uh, if you have any questions about this, um, I'm going to post the PowerPoint, and obviously the presentation will have that posted online as well. But if you have specific questions for me that you weren't able to ask, or questions that come up, uh, please feel free to, to contact me about anything and everything related to this topic. And I do, for people who want to see some primary source articles in the PowerPoint, I do have some references if you want to see uh, a little bit more about what the research says about this. Uh, and I have more references too if, if you need them. So I have lots of references if you need them. So, um, so that is all that we have for today. Thank you for joining us. And yeah, thanks everybody. We appreciate you uh, participating and um, Hopefully, uh, we'll keep in touch. And if you have any questions, please do uh, contact us. So um, I think we're just going to go ahead and exit. Maybe we'll just okay. we could pause here for just a second to see if there are any last comments. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would actually be you know for for middle school folks, I would actually be really curious to know. Kind of what are what are middle school students able to do uh, with with something like this? How sort of how open ended uh, of a situation could a um, could a sixth or a seventh grader um, handle? You know, obviously my, my specialty is with with older students, and so sometimes my perspective on what students can do can get a little bit warped because of that. Um, we had a great comment from one of the teachers talking about using a book of math mysteries mm -hmm. with fourth to eighth graders. With uh, each mystery is two pages long, and it requires students to weed out information, make mm -hmm. assumptions, model, represent, and, and solve yeah. the problem. That's great. That's right. And, uh, and a comment from Victoria about our kids struggling, <laughs> like your kids. Yeah, they str yeah. everybody struggles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah it's, it, the science and math is interesting. Um, 
the, the, the process to get into science and math is really competitive and so all of our students come here uh, with a history of academic success and so you know the first time they experience academic difficulty is really a, a shock to them and so you know they, they've been successful using certain strategies prior to, to getting here and so when we get them to try to ask them to do some things uh, why should I why should I think I've never had to, to think before that sort of thing so um, but, uh, and, and again, I, I found that with honors students when I taught honors classes versus general classes at Crow Tan, it was a similar thing. You know, the honors kids were often much more resistant to this idea, which is kind of ironic, but uh, anyway. Okay, well that about wraps it up. Um, I'm going to... Parents might struggle, yeah, right. I think a lot of, this is, this is hard stuff. It is not easy, uh, to be sure. So, yeah, thank you, Victoria. And thank you all. I hope you all have a nice afternoon.